Good morning, Sabbath School. Good morning. Well, this is the day that the Lord has blessed. Let us all rejoice and be glad in it. Um, it's so nice for us to be here this morning. God has blessed us with life, with strength, so that we can come and worship him in spirit and in truth. I just want to welcome you all in the mighty name of Jesus. Welcome those who are watching us online. May you feel the Holy Spirit as we worship with our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, um, fellow members, for joining us. We are so happy that you are here. Let us pray. Kind, righteous, compassionate Father, we thank you, O oh God, for this day. We thank you, Lord, for sparing our lives so that we can come before you and worship you in spirit and in truth. Lord Jesus, I pray, O oh God, that if there is anything that's blocking us away from you, I pray, O Father, that it, you will remove it. Kill self, O oh God, so that your name can be glorified. Be with us today, Lord, and bless us as we worship you. In no other name I pray, but the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Happy Sabbath, everyone. We have come to the part where we can praise God in song. Our first hymn of praise is a Sabbath hymn, hymn number 394, Far From All Care, We Hail the Sabbath Morning, 394. Oh! 
second hymn of praise is hymn number 602, O Brother, Be Faithful. Hymn number 602, O Brother, Be Faithful. O Brother, Be Faithful, Son Jesus. Jesus will come for whom we have waited so long. Oh, soon we shall enter a glorious home and join in the conqueror's song. Oh, brother, be faithful for why should we prove unfaithful to him who has shown such deep, such unbounded and infinite love, who died to redeem us his own. Oh, brother, be faithful, the city of gold, prepared for the good and the blessed, is waiting his portals of pearl to unfold. Welcome thee in to thy rest. Then, brother, prove faithful, not long shall we stay in weariness here and for long. Time's dark night of sorrow is wearing away. We haste to the glory of more. Oh, brother, be faithful, he soon will descend. Creation's omnipotent king. While legions of angels his chariot attempt, and palm reaps of victory bring. Oh, brother, be faithful, and soon thou shall hear. The Savior pronounced the glad word. Well done, faithful servant, thy title is clear to enter the joy of thy Lord. O oh, brother, be faithful, eternity's years shall tell for thy faithfulness now. When bright smiles of gladness shall scatter thy tears, a coron a gleam on thy brow. O brother, be faithful, the promise is sure that waits for the faithful and try to reign with the ransom immortal and pure. And ever with Jesus abide. Our last hymn of praise is hymn number 286, Wonderful Words of Life. Hymn number 286, Wonderful Words of Life. Sing them over again to me, wonderful words of life. Let me more of their beauty see, wonderful words of life. Words of life of beauty, teach me faith and duty, beautiful words. Wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Christ the Blessed One gives to all. Wonderful
wonderful words of life. Sing a list to the loving call. Wonderful words of life. All so freely given, wooing us to heaven. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Sweetly echo the gospel call, wonderful words of life. Offer pardon and peace to all, wonderful words of life. Jesus, on the Savior, sanctify forever. Wonderful words of life, beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Thank you. This week's memory verse is taken from Hebrews 1, verse 2 and 3. But in these last days, he has spoken us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made the universe. The son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, turn to your neighbor and say, I'm happy if you've got a mask on. Come on, turn to your neighbor if you've got a mask on and say, I'm happy. Amen. 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 Um, it's, 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 it's good to see some of my prayer line folk. I was expecting Otilia to come and do her regular introduction taking us to the throne room of God, flying on flight 777, and all of those things that she normally says. Um, one of the most important things today is to discover Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So amidst our discussion, let that be our focus. Amen. Um, Christ must be seen, must be known, and must be heard. Now, there are several things or several ways we can go about this. Um, one, we can definitely look at the memory text and dissect it. Two, we can go day by day, which will give us day one, and then we'll run out of time. Um, three, we can share testimony to the promise and glory of God. Or four, I can teach it like I do at Stambra. And you say nothing. So, uh, what would you like? I, I, I can't hear you. All of the above. Okay. Now, I do know that the pastor has to preach today. Amen? So, uh, I'm not going to go that far. But what, I, what we will do, we'll mix everything up. Is that all right? So, the first thing is, is that God has a promise. Hallelujah. If you know anything about God's promises, he has a whole lot of promises. But in Genesis 3 and verse 15, there is a promise that we must never forget. I want someone to find it after I pray, and then we'll read it, and then we'll move forward. Father, speak. Give us power like we've never had before. May your presence come, and may this not just be a lesson study. For we don't know if we will be here tomorrow. But let this be a rendezvous with you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you'd like to make a comment, you're going to need to come to the microphone so the folk online can see what you look like and hear you clearly. Um, and so we will not take anybody heckling from the pew. Amen? 
um, and uh, uh, I have some security guards that will shut you down. Good. They don't know they're security guards, but I'll point to them when the time comes. Amen. Genesis 3.15. Somebody read that for me. Amen. Will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Amen. Amen. This was the original promise. Why was this promise necessary? Can anyone tell me? Why was this promise necessary? Real quick. Because of sin. Thank you. So the promise was necessary because who sinned? Man sinned. If you say Eve, it's a mistake. Based upon patriarchs and prophets, man sinned. And because man sinned, hallelujah, God now gives us a promise. What I like about God is that he doesn't wait to give the promise. Come on now. He gives the reassurance up front. I love God. Come on, say amen. Amen. Have you ever sinned in your life and and you felt shame and guilt? Come on. And and you wondered what would be said and what would be done. And you're trembling in trepidation because you've gone against what you know. And then all of a sudden, God sends you a word. Not the next day, not the next week, but he sends you the word even the same day. Gives you a reassurance. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That everything will be all right. And that is why I told people when the pandemic struck and we were struggling to open churches and everything else. I said, don't worry about a thing because every little thing. Yeah, you all know the song. Amen. We're going to pray for all of those that recited that part of the song. We're going to pray for you. Amen. 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 Let's let's dig deeper. So God said he was going to send a seed. Now we have an issue because everyone in scripture seems to think instantly they want it and they want it now you know what i'm talking about so adam and eve is looking for the seed the problem is is that when you have instant religion mm, you will always be disappointed ready to leave god come on now ready to walk away from god why because You are living in an instant life, instant coffee for those that sin. I mean, those that drink it, Uh, instant microwave food. Come on now, instant, instant. And so God's going to send you a seed and the seed is going to come and you're looking for the seed tomorrow. When the seed doesn't come tomorrow, all of a sudden generations are lost. Because they think God is taking too long, come on now, to keep his promise. But part of the promise keeping of God is the word trust. Come on now. You've got to trust God. Hallelujah. You've got to trust God so much that even if God takes century after century after century, you know God's word is true. It's better than TSB, better than Lloyd's. Come on now, better than Barclays. I'm talking about God's word. It's true. Never fail. I got a question. How can we, watch this, how can we get out of this instant mentality that only cripples us and makes us operate on fear instead of faith? I dare somebody to answer that question. How can we get out of it? You said faith? Trust? Submission, belief, good, good word. Huh? Patience, and, and you know what? That is a characteristic of the fruit of the Spirit and the remnant. Here is the patience of the saints. Come on, here are those that keep the commandments. How the faith of Jesus Christ. What, what, what else? What else? What else can we do to get out of this instant? Yes, bro. You're going to need to. Okay, get, just give me one second. Uh huh. Okay, no problem. Okay, real quick. Okay. 
and who you was looking for the promise? Sure, sure. I think we answered the question. Um, he made the promise to man, and man was looking for the promise. Good. When he said to man, I don't like it that way. He make it to Ab to Adam, and Adam think it when he first was born. He thought that's where the promise was. Okay. Wrong right. or right? Yes, you're very right. That's right. Let's get back to the, my question. Because the instant is important. We will not move forward if we continue to live in this instant kind of religion that we have. Where people have no patience and they can't wait. Come on now. There are people who used to be members of this church. But said God is taking too long. Things are not happening the way I want it, so I must leave. And if it don't happen the next time nominating committee come, I'm gone. Instant. The promises of God are true and sure. Is anybody hearing what I'm saying? And because they are true and sure, they will come to pass. I dare you to get excited about that. God said he's going to send a seed. The seed is going to beat up on the devil. Come on now. The devil will be totally annihilated and then Jesus will come. Is everybody hearing what I said? Boy, we went through generation after generation and guess what? Everyone was still looking for the seed, expecting it to come in their time. Now, let's talk about the latter days. In the text, in the Greek, you know, that text in Hebrew, uh, Hebrews 1, 1 to 4 is an interesting text. Because in the Greek, that is only one line. It's not, it's not four verses. It's only one line. The English translation is what's made it four verses. And the key thing in this text, which was read earlier, the memory text, uh, that we mustn't forget, is the word, there's a few words that's in the Greek that we, we, I don't want us to forget. Uh -huh. But in these last days, that's there. Come on, say amen. Who is the last days? Where in the last days? When is the last days? What is the text talking to? Thank you. The last days begins from Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Now, I'm 58 years young. Amen. And I look good. Some of you saying amen and laughing. Sandra, I don't know what this is all about. And I've been hearing about this last day thing since I showed up on the planet. Eight pounds. Come on now. I've been hearing about this last day thing. I got a problem. And the problem is, when I was one, I wanted Jesus to come. Now I'm 58, I still want Jesus to come. And he ain't come. I told you before, God keeps his promises. You all got to help me here. How? Hey, don't preach my son. <laughs> uh, brethren, I'm tired. Are you tired? Why hasn't Jesus come? Huh? The gospel must be preached all the world. We're still waiting. Sound like a Bob Marley song, right? We're still waiting. Huh? The, after the gospel, we're not ready. And, and we're not in one accord in one place. And God's time is different to our boy. I like that one. That's Rolex talk. Come on now, I like that one. I like that one. You seem to, to know that eternity is eternity. Time, time is no time. This is no time for God. Okay, and, and that's Charles' point, and that's eternity. God is dealing with eternity. We're dealing with time. Uh, anything, Brother Essen? You're going to need to do something. Somebody help me with this mic. Okay. Mm -hmm. First, he said it's because we don't know ready. It's not true. God have a time appointed. Not when we're ready. He's from any time. And he have a number. I can't tell you his number. Okay. His number is number seven. Okay. Number seven. 
Okay. His time not come yet. He have his time appointed to come. Of not course. when we're ready. Of course. When the time when he's ready. That's right. That's right. That's right. But I think the point was, Brother Essen, is that the scripture tells us that God is not willing that any should perish. That's what we're saying. And we're not saying that's the time. That's why he hasn't come. We know why he hasn't come. Matthew 24 tells us. Yeah, and it tells us very easily. And that is the gospel of the kingdom must be preached into all the world as a witness. Then the end shall come. We know that. But I'm just making the point. There may be young people looking at us this morning and thinking to ourselves, I've heard this before. And I haven't seen no Jesus. Come on now. Uh, These things haven't changed. As a matter of fact, there is less people in the church now than they were last year. And so the issue we have is, is the promise still valid? Is it? I dare you to stand up on your feet. Come to the microphone, somebody, and tell me why this promise is still valid. Come on. You said it emphatically, now move. Put your money where your mouth is. Where you at? Why is this promise still valid? Yeah, well, I think God Good morning, is a God. Sir. Morning, 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 Pastor. God is a God of His. The word. pastor looks younger. You don't believe that? <laughs> what happened since the last time I was here? This pastor. God pastor is look a... about. Hold on, Pastor. Don't say nothing yet. We gotta figure figure what's happening in the pastor's house. The pastor, Pastor looks about twenty five. The blessings of God. He must have been to Grenada. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, go ahead. Sir. Sure, surely. God is a God of his word. Mm -hmm. And because I've seen how he has kept his word in the past, yes. I can trust he will keep his word again. Come on. And to me, that is why I, I still think the promise is valid. If God does not change, yeah. I'm going to hold on to his promises. Hey, 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 hey. Come on now, come on. The pastor said he's seen God do things in the past. And the song says if he does it, he'll do it again. And he'll do it again. Come on now. Anybody else? Why, why should we believe in this God right now? Lies is of the devil. Yes. Um, God is not a God of lies. Mm -hmm. And so whatever he says will and must come true because God is a consistent God. Amen. Can you say amen? God is not a liar. Hallelujah. And God is consistent. Two words that stand out there for me. Uh, anybody else, you're coming to the mic real quick and you're telling me why, 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 why I must still believe in this God that, 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 that said he's coming soon and soon doesn't seem to be coming. Uh -huh. God is a God. Now, I know you could walk. Don't stand out there and shout. Okay, so you need to come to the mic. God is a God. He changes not. Amen. What God said back then is what he says now. Hallelujah. And it will come to pass. No, you say that. Good. The, I'm, going, I'm going back to the last days. God promised, yes, I said that earlier, God's promise is mature. I'm going back to the last days, and this is so important. Brethren, I don't know if we really believe we're living in the last days. Because we're acting like we're building bigger bonds. Come on now. We're acting like we're accumulating wealth to stay here. Is anybody hearing what I'm saying? We're acting like, you know what? Brethren, we have a whole lot of time. If we truly believe that this was the last, if this is the last days, our behavior will be different. The way we treat one another would be different. Our attitude, come on now, towards the spreading of the gospel would be different. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I'm really concerned about this. From the conference to the pew. I don't know if we got this right, brethren, because if we truly believe in the message given to this church in 1863, come on now, that means that we should be in a different space. Churches have no evangelistic mandate. Brethren, I'm going to step on some toes today because I'm sick and tired of people in the UK acting like we don't need to do evangelism. I travel the world, and I'm telling you, I travel the world, and you see evangelism that they're doing on massive scale because they believe it's the last days. I come to England, and we're here quibbling over the color of the paint on the wall. 
And we're thinking about, well, I don't like her, so I'm not going to vote for her. God is not democratic. I'm pausing for effect. But I'm serious. When I read this comment in the lesson about the last days, I was thinking in my mind, Pastor, that we don't get it. People are not talking to one another in the same church. And then we lie and say we believe it's the last days. If it's the last days, brethren, guess what? Now, I used to work at a job, and if you know me, you know I enjoy leisure time. Come on, say amen. I, I'm a social person, so I used to like to chill. However, however, amen, um, five minutes before the, the clock struck two, which was the end of lunchtime, uh -huh, everyone would be preparing to get back to their desk. But I'm the kind of guy, because I felt I had charm, amen, I, I, the boss wouldn't give me a hard time if I arrived a few minutes late. Well, one day, after this had gone on for almost a year, guess what? I show up uh -huh, at about five past the hour of two. When I get there, the boss is in my room. And so he's looking now, he's a, he's a white guy, so he's turned beetroot color. He does totally look colored. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and, and so he looks at me and, and, and begins to tell me that he's given me an official warning because he's noticed this consistently. I, I, I tried my best to get out of the habit, but because it was so ingrained when everyone else was preparing to go back for two, I was still chilling. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And so I was chilling and until such a time he gave me a second warning. He told me if he gave me the third, then I'll have to leave the job. Are you hearing what I'm trying to say? There were a couple of things that stuck out for me. One is I knew the time, but I was complacent. That word is the problem we have. The enemy has sown it into our churches, and we are complacent. I'm talking about the last days. The second issue was I had done it for so long that even when I tried to change, I wish someone knew what I was saying. Even when I tried to change, I couldn't change. Bad habit. And I think both of those speak to where we are today. So my next question. My next question, and this is a very important question, is how are we going to change? How are we going to change? 2022, we just started 10 days of prayer we just ended last night. We did all the stuff we need to do. We cannot do business as usual. 2022. Come on now. So come on. I want three people to stand up in your congregation. Come to the mic and tell me how we're going to change. Sing and smile and pray. That's the only way. If you sing and smile and pray, you praise a thousand away. Pray and pray and pray. And pray. Oh, no, so the pastor, if, if yeah, you're impressed, I mean, go ahead. I mean, I don't want to be the first again, but, mm -hmm. but here's what. Um, as I look in scripture, I recognize sometimes change comes with death. Yes. There are times when a generation has to die. See, 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 you took my notes, yeah. man. He went to For Joshua. God he went to, to actually Joshua. begin to do something new. Yes. Because until we remain, mm -hmm. it is easier for him to remove us than change us. Yes. And, and, and it's not that we... Hold on, hold on, hold on. Stop. Let, let that sink in. Yeah. Put that on your Facebook status. It's easier for God to remove us. Come yeah. on now. Because some of us are so stuck like monuments. Yeah. 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 And you see that in churches. I mean, sometimes until you move people mm. out of the way, you can actually implement new things. And I'm wondering if as a church... God doesn't have to do something, cause some of what we have to die, yeah. so that he can start something new. Wow, 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 wow. That's Joshua talk. Moses had to die in order for Joshua to show up and take them to the promised land. Well, we didn't say we have to, but we are suggesting that in Scripture, change sometimes comes with a generational shift. So come see. You see with the word, when you can attend death, which is life, they all force to surrender 
Good. Now, the word of God, if we say we are Christians, mm -hmm. then we are children of God, and we should be the example mm -hmm. of Jesus Christ. Come on. And Jesus Christ died to save us, so we too should be sur surrendering, as in the Lord, I'm in your hands, you take me. Mm -hmm. You take me and make me ready to use me for whatsoever. And that's what it's all about. Yeah, I like that. Surrender. That's right. And you know what? There is a part of surrender which is death. Amen? There's a part of surrender which is death. Are you coming? Come. Yeah, very quick, sir. Come. Oh. You're talking about how are we going to change. Mm -hmm. As I was studying my Bible about the seven last plagues. Okay. The first six plagues, you could repent. Mm -hmm. And they still never repent. When the plague comes, they would never repent. And Correct. the last plague, when they would repent, it's, your repentance is finished. When time the angel comes down in the pool and it's and it coming like a smoke, and then a, um, half scorpion come out and sting people for five months, and they want to die. Mm -hmm. And they cannot die. Death runs from them. That time you cannot change. When we have the time to change, we need to change. We don't change. Yeah, love it. Yeah, Good. Good. Just come. I think that we need to look at our priorities as a church. Mm -hmm. I think we need to stop clinging to tradition and go back to what the Word of God actually says Good. in terms of its principles. Mm -hmm. Um. There's a lot of emphasis on things that aren't getting us anywhere. We, I was at a BUC session not too long ago in right. October. Yeah, that, 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 yeah, 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 yeah. Go tread softly right now. Go. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I was, absolutely, that's fine. Um, and we were talking about church, church growth. Yes. And in a population of almost 70 million, mm -hmm. the population of the SCA church is only about 40,000 people. Mm -hmm. It's less than that, if you count less on, than that. on Sabbath, if you count less the attending, attending membership. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So yeah. that even further yeah. drives my It's point. the lowest in the world church. Mm -hmm. The lowest in the world church. Mm -hmm. And I think, and if you look at what you mentioned about evangelism, mm -hmm. if you look at the Caribbean, if you look at India, if you look at other Asian countries, Africa, Africa Eastern the, Europe, the whole, it, it's all booming. And mm -hmm. we need to look at why. Why are we not relatable to the general public. Mm -hmm. What is it that we need to do to change, mm -hmm. to look inside ourselves? It's not about compromising your principles or your standards. It is about focusing on what is actually right. And I've noticed a trend where we look at tradition, what is Adventist custom, what is Adventist tradition, what, is, what are people wearing, how are they wearing it, when are they wearing it, why they're wearing it, instead of looking at the principles that Jesus tried to drive home, which is, I do not count your appearance as anything. I count your inner character, and I want to change it. He didn't see the Samaritan woman and said, well, you're sleeping with all these men, so therefore, I can't help you. He was a Jewish man speaking to a Samaritan woman. Mm -hmm. They weren't even supposed to be conversing. Mm -hmm. So I think we need to refocus our priorities. Very good. Very good. Very good. Amen. 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 Now, what the sister said is true. However, I need to put the however. Can I put the however? Because I actually believe that if this is truly the last day, then it will affect how we dress, what we eat. Come on now. I, 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 you know, I went to court the other day. Pastor, I went to court. You'll forgive me on this one. Went to court because they told me I was speeding. They told me. But I was moving at the pace of the angels. And the whites say they move with great speed. Come on, say amen. And I was moving with the angels, trying to make it to a, a ministry appointment. And as I'm making my way, hallelujah, on the M4, you know there's a 50 mile an hour long stretch. So I'm coming from Reading, coming into London, and I'm coming, and, and, and I get caught twice. One going and one coming. Doing 57 in 50. So I go to court. The first one, I go to school. Come on, say amen. When I go to court, I am my own attorney. 
I told them that the signs were not visible or very clear. I tried to use all my defense. And then the attorney, the, the judge says to me that ignorance is no defense. Did you see 50 when you started the motorway? Yes, I saw 50. Well, it didn't change until you saw another one. I'm going somewhere. Then he looked at my license and he said, oh, he said, you're going to get three points for this one. He said, you already have six points. He said, if you get three more points, you're on a band. I said, well, judge, you know, my mom is, can't walk and I take care of her. He said, well, get her an Uber. Now you can't cuss the judge. Come on, say amen. But that's what was in my mind. Now watch this. Let me tell you the reason I'm telling you the story. It's because he says you have until December not to get three points. Because your first three points will be spent in December. He said, be cautious as you drive. I wish someone knew what I just said. I'm saying something. Brethren, I'm erring on the cautious side now. I lived a life as a young person right on the edge and daring people to tell me to change. Now you don't need to tell me. Come on, say amen. Because everything I do now is because I need to make it to the kingdom. It's the last days. Is someone hearing what I'm saying? And I'm being extremely cautious. The message is, hallelujah. Brethren, the sister said it, follow the Bible according to the word of God, but be extremely cautious that you don't step onto the other side. That means that i got to watch the way I behave. Come on now. Not because I'm fearful, but because I want to win the prize. I see your hand here. Come to the microphone. I'm not sure I like the word change. Maybe okay. two words are probably the same. I believe in growth. Okay, good. And, good. and probably growth means change. Yes, 100%. Because I'm not the same as I was when I was 10 years old. So <laughs> I don't four, know. You look, you, you look good. You look <laughs> so I believe that the Christian should be growing in his, in his Christian experience. Yes. You shouldn't be thinking every day, I need to change this or change that. Right. You should think about maturity and growth. Right. You should grow up in Christ. Yes. You should mature. Whenever your spiritual growth is stifled, if you are responding the same way you responded five years ago yes. to certain situation, you're not growing. Wonderful. Maturity would indicate yes. that you respond differently. Wonderful. The way I deal with my wife or with my children, I, if I can go back when my child was five years old, mm -hmm. I would deal with her differently yep. if I had the same knowledge and understanding and growth and maturity that I have today. So the Christian is urged to grow to up grow in Christ. In the knowledge. And, 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 and that would help. Wonderful. Are you a doctor? Doctor? Yes. No, not yet. Okay, you sound, you sound very much like a doctor. Now watch this. <laughs> Pastor, there is a seminar that you need to do in your church for the people in the church. And if you're an educator, you probably know about this. It's called the Growth Mindset Seminar. I sat there, and I'm piggybacking on what you said. We had a, the BUC put on this thing um, of growth mindset um, for all the educators. This was some years ago. Keith, I don't know if you remember, some years ago. And we were there. And that thing changed my life. And it's what you said. And that is, if you are doing the same thing as you did last year this time, then you haven't grown. There should be a cycle of growth in your life. Amen. And that seminar needs to go to every church. So we're always looking for maturity. Hallelujah. And we're reaching for the goal. I need to move on. And I want to move into this area. Oh, sorry, Atelia. I didn't, I, stay there, Atelia. Yeah, stay there because I didn't realize you had crutches. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I didn't realize all of that. I was picking on you, but I didn't realize yeah. your situation. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. <laughs> go ahead. Now, I'm not going to comment about my crutch right now. <laughs> I want to thank God that I like what Elder Leslie said about growth. Mm. So we grow as we go. But I'm looking at the word change. Come on. 
So inside of us, Jesus says, come as you are. Good. So when we come to him, he is the one that changed from inside out. Good. And so therefore, he is looking at the heart. Mm -hmm. He started to work on the heart. Mm -hmm. So it's nothing that we can do for ourselves to bring this change. We have to depend on Jesus himself. Amen. 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 And that... I hear the bell going. I think there's a mistake with the bell. The person didn't look at the time too well. It was a mistake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have about half an hour to go. Amen. Good. That's, that, that's, we live in hope. Amen. So I want to go back then because we have five minutes. We've looked at the last days. We've looked at the importance of the promise. Amen. Can we take a moment and look at Jesus Christ? Can we? Because I think if we don't do that, we haven't done the lesson justice. Okay? How does Jesus Christ fulfill the promise? How? How does he fulfill the promise? Abraham didn't do it. David didn't do it. Uh, how does Jesus Christ fulfill the promise? Come on, guys. You guys have been in this. I've been in this thing longer than me. Some of y'all. Huh? To his death. Okay, through his death. Now watch this. When he came as a baby in a manger, do you think the people believed, come on now, that he was the fulfillment of the promise? They didn't, did he? Okay, when he was 12 and he walked away from Mary and Joseph, you know the story, and, 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 and they were looking for him, and he ended up in a synagogue debating with the people. Uh, do, do the, did the people really believe he was the one? At what point then did we honestly believe or did they honestly believe that he was the promised one? After Pentecost? The pen of inspiration said there is one thing that changed the course of history. And that is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Brethren, if they had any doubt in their minds, come on now, that he was, the pro he was not the promise or was the promise, I came by here to tell you at Calvary it was done. Hallelujah. Brethren, what a way to solidify and validate the promise to apply blood. Now, you know that in Scripture, when an oath is done and a covenant is made, it's a blood covenant. That means it cannot be reversed. Come on now. The two parties are signing up with blood. Is that all right? Uh, the sad thing is, is that God keeps his promises. But here we are. A sum total of every promise we've made to God, but yet we're still failing. And I want to come back to Atelier's point. Because whether we like it or not, what we feel or how we feel about Christ's death will determine, come on now, how much we love him and how much we love each other. God makes the change. We don't make the change. We can wish for change and we can do it. But brethren, unless we're submissive, where's the lady that said submission? Unless we're submissive, there will be no change. And some of us think that our expertise, education, and ability, come on now, to decipher theology. And I'm going somewhere. Because I'm very, very concerned that we have moved out of this status where now we feel we're on the level with God. Pastor, I went to school for seven years to study theology. And when I came out there, I thought to myself, I'm going to assist God in the work. Come on, say amen. And God is moving. But all of a sudden, here come some folk, never been to school in their life, don't even know what Greek or Hebrew says, don't even know policy. Come on now. But they show up in church because they got some generational expertise. And they hold the church hostage. The promise of God or the promise of God. There's a play there. You're going to get it Tuesday. It's built in Jesus Christ. 
I suppose my final question to you is this. Do you accept Jesus Christ as being everything that we need? Is that, is that a good question? There's some people who believe that we have to do our part and he has to do his part. Is the acceptance of the promise of Jesus all that we need? Because it must include surrender. It must include being submissive. It must include, um, uh, give me some more words. Obedience, thank you. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Who said that? Yeah, that pastor, give that lady a 10-pound note there. That lady. <laughs> that lady right there. Because that is characteristics of remnant. That is the characteristic, obedience, the keeping the commandments in, 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 in Revelation 4 and verse 12. It's not just talking about 10 commandments. It's actually the word used there in the Greek means obeying. And some of us struggle with that because we feel we're too above. But all God wants is simple, baby-like obedience. And so, let me wrap this up. Because the Sabbath school superintendent will lose her position um, if we don't do this. I've got so much gadgets here. I don't know which one is gone. I think the battery is gone in that one. And then this one is not recognizing my face. Oh, there you go. It's recognizing my face now. we got all kinds of stuff going on. Let's do this. Hallelujah. When I look at the promise of God, there is a, a, a statement in Hebrews chapter 1 which talks about the glory of God. You know the statement. If you study less, you know the statement. Brethren, when we realize the power, hallelujah, in the promise, talking about Jesus Christ, we should walk in the glory of God. Are you hearing what I'm saying? It shouldn't take past to have to preach for half an hour to get you to get happy and excited. Come on now. Brethren, the glory of God means that my disposition, like Moses coming off the mountain, is now changed. The glory of God means, hallelujah, that ev in every at every opportunity, I give God honor and glory. Is that all right? When I see someone on the road and they're struggling, my behavior towards them should exhibit the glory of God. Are you hearing what I'm saying? The exhibit of the glory of God is not one where we sit down and look like Levites as people pass and we don't do nothing about it. The glory of God should move you into action. The glory of God. People should look at you one day. I won't tell you who she is because some of you are spiritual investigators. I was dating a girl. Amen. And, and, <laughs> and, 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 and pastor, I went into a restaurant and, and there was a, um, it was an Adventist um, restaurant that used to be in Regent Street. You all know the one there. Country Life, I think they call it. And I, was, I went in there, hallelujah. And, and, and so I went there, and, and the young lady that was with me, um, she was sitting down eating. And then the lady who was serving us said, um, she said, um, you know, are you, which church do you go to? To the young lady. She said, oh, I, I don't really go to church. She said, oh. She said, because you really look like an Adventist. And so what she was saying was the girl had no jewelry on. And she probably did that because she was going with me. Come on, say amen. She didn't have any makeup. You know all that kind of stuff that we see as Adventists. But what I wish she had said was, young lady, you're glowing. Like the Holy Ghost is on you. Come on, say amen. Have you all ever seen someone like that? Where you just see the presence of God. Hallelujah. And let me say this. Wherever the glory of God is, is an opportunity for miracles. Oh, you didn't hear what I said. Because miracles happen in the presence and present of God. Hallelujah. Brethren, I didn't come by here to take your time this morning, but I just wanted to lift up Jesus. I just wanted to tell you that we do have a promise and the promise is still valid. I do want to tell you, hallelujah, that we got to stay in the glory of God. I do want to tell you to be cautious because it is the last days. I do want to tell you that as you, because it's the last days, we must now treat our brother and sister in the way that we should. Come on now. I just came by here to let you know, hallelujah, that the final part of this promise is Jesus coming back a second time. Hallelujah. I came by here to tell you that it won't be long. Count the 
years as months. Count the months as weeks. Count the weeks as days. Any day now. Finding the true way. Many events were staged around town to celebrate a big religious holiday in Timor Leste, and I decided to go to the horse races. To reach the horse racing track, I had to walk past a Seventh day Adventist church. As I passed, a Bible worker, Mariano, saw me and chased after me. If you have time, would you like to study the Bible together? He asked. I had studied with Adventists in their homes a few times, but I had stopped meeting with them because they seemed to teach the same things, as my own church. Still, when the Bible worker ran after me, I felt a deep desire to know more about the Bible. I would like to study the Bible, I said. You don't need to come to my house, Mariano said. I'll go to your house. After the horse races end, we can go there. We went to my house right after the races, and started studying the Bible. We studied together for four months, and I agreed to go to the Adventist church, with the Bible worker every Sabbath. I still went to my church on Sundays. I didn't see anything wrong with worshipping on Saturdays and Sundays. After some time, an Adventist evangelist arrived, I studied Daniel and Revelation with him. In Daniel 7.25, we read, He shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend to change times and law, NKJV. At home, I open my Bible, and read the verse again and again. He shall speak pompous words against the Most High shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend to change times and law. I said to myself, it turns out, that what I have believed for years is not true. I closed my Bible and tried to sleep. I wondered whether the Adventists were trying to deceive me. Maybe they had intentionally showed me the verse, to convince me to join their church. Getting up, I turned on the light and read, He shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend to change times and law. As I read, I felt impressed that my church had changed the time of the Sabbath, and the law that declares the seventh day is the Sabbath. Later, I realized, that the Holy Spirit was convicting my heart. Immediately, I decided to fast, and I prayed, Is Saturday or Sunday the true Sabbath? Is my church or the Adventist church the true church? After fasting and praying for a week, a thought spoke to me, You had better follow what is written in the Bible. I determined to follow God's will, as expressed in Scripture. Although, I attended church every Sabbath, the pastor never invited me to be baptized. After worship services, he and I usually ate together, and discuss the Bible. One Sabbath, between Sabbath school and church, I asked the pastor, when will there be a baptism, for the new people who want to be baptized? It depends on the person who wants to be baptized, he said. We can arrange a baptism for him or her whenever they are ready. At that moment I made up my mind. If there is baptism, I want to be baptized, I said. Immediately, the pastor hugged me. Adults and children saw our joy, and came over to shake my hand and embrace me. You have been called by God, they told me. When I heard those words, I wept. I had found God's true way. Today, Mario is a Bible worker and has led many people to God's true way through Bible studies, and the power of the Holy Spirit. We will read about several of those people, over the next few weeks. Your 13th Sabbath offering six years ago, helped open the first and only Seventh-day Adventist school in Timor Leste. This quarter's offering, will help construct a dormitory at the school, so that children from faraway villages, such as those where Mario serves as a Bible worker, can study at the school. Thank you for planning a generous offering. What a beautiful day, what a beautiful start for the Sabbath this morning. We all just want to, what a blessing. Anyway, we've listened to the mission story, and you've, we've heard the appeal for offering. And I'm just here to ask if anyone who, has, who brought an offering to Sabbath school this morning, I'm just here to collect it. And remember, the, the Lord has promised, again, another consistent word we've been using this morning, that our storehouse will never go empty. 
This will help to support the purchase of our quarterlies and to help with the missionary work around the world. I'll just stand here with it, and if you just come and just drop your offering, please. Happy Sabbath, everyone. As the offering is, as the Sabbath school offering is being collected, I want to add my thanks to um, Pastor Patrick, or should I say to my big brother? Seems very odd calling him um, pastor or brother or to, you know, to, I note I said my, my big brother, older brother. He said his age, and yeah, I'm, I'm the baby of the bunch. Um, you know, Ray. Um, expounded on the lesson. I don't need to go through the, the, the lesson again, so I'm going to summarize it as this. The title, Jesus the Promised Son. <clears throat> Sunday told us about the last days, and Monday reminded us that God spoke to us by his son. Tuesday said, he is the radiance of the glory of God, and by Wednesday we're told through whom he made the universe. And on Thursday, the message was, Today, I have begotten you. And Friday's summary, in fact, the whole lesson, as Ray said, points to Jesus. You see, Adam and Eve thought that the promise would be fulfilled with them. Abraham thought the promise would be fulfilled through him and his seed. And David thought that the promise would be fulfilled through him. They all missed the true promise, the fulfillment of the, of the promise, and that is Jesus. You see... The glory of God is manifested in Jesus. God's word is light. Both Old and New Testament, both the Old and the New Testament is light because of Jesus. This world was created by Jesus. The blessing of the resurrection is shown through Jesus and his resurrection. Our salvation, our destiny is assured all because of Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus is the foundation of all created existence. You know, there's a song that simply says, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. There is something about that name. Master, Savior, Jesus. Like the fragrance after the rain. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Let heaven and earth proclaim. Kings and kingdoms will all pass away. But there's something about that name, friends, because there is power in that name. There's deliverance in that name. There is salvation in that name. And that name is Jesus, Amen. the promised son. Pastor, come and pray for us. <clears throat> Let's pray. Indeed, take the name of Jesus with you, child of suffering and of woe. He will joy and comfort give you. Take his name wherever you go. Father, if there's one thing we want to take away from this lesson and from every lesson, we have an eternal promise wrapped up, tangled up in the person of Jesus Christ. Thank you for this reminder, and may we always spread this gospel to a dying world. We love you, Lord. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Good morning, church. Just have one or two announcements. Elder, I think, um, like me, I am sure there are many people sitting down wondering, did you get that third? <laughs> praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Um, I know that little stretch of motorway very well. It's not very nice. Um, just a couple of announcements here. I, first of all, I, I, want to, um, I want to ask you to continue um, be fastidious about wearing your mask. I looked around and I can see everyone wearing their mask, and I just want to um, commend you for doing so. We, um, we um, are understanding that this... Uh, this um, this virus is still jumping around, and we want to ensure that everyone is kept safe. Um, we have uh, many sanitizing stations um, around the church, and we would ask you to make use of them. Um, they are there for a reason. Um, let's use them, and um, let's do our part to knock this virus down dead. Uh, we want it out of our lives. Um, thank you for um, thank you for doing that. Um, secondly, I, I want to invite you to um, to pay attention to the announcements. Um, they are they are in the um, the bulletin. Um, it's good to um, to actually look at them and be acquainted with them. Um, they carry um, very very important um, information. Suffice it to say, let me just um, let me just highlight here that um, this coming Wednesday, 
Um, the usual time is uh, our prayer and fasting session. And so you are, you're asked to, um, to let's join together um, in this prayer and fasting session. Um, at a time as we are now, we cannot pray enough. Um, and I think, um, I think we are comforted because God hears our prayers. Um, secondly, I just want to um, remind you that we still have Wednesday evening prayer meeting. Wednesday evening prayer meeting. Um, please do not wait to be reminded. Put it in your diaries. Put it in your, um, in your phone. Um, whatever device you have that keeps your appointments, let's put it in there so that we will know when prayer meeting time comes. Make sure we put an alert on so that it, it buzzes maybe an hour before or two hours before. It sends us a reminder so that we will have no excuse. Not that I believe we have any excuse at all. Um, I think we, we, we need to recharge our batteries. And that is a good way to recharge our batteries. Just as coming to church Sabbath mornings, it is a, a fantastic way to come and a fellowship and uh, ascribe praise and glory and adoration to the Lord. I, I, just want to, um, I just want to highlight here that if you have a burning, if you have um, one of these campfires, um, and I know about these campfires, they keep you very warm when we go camping. Um, but you know, the fire, doesn't matter how much the fire is blazing, if you take one, one bit of the wood out, blazing in just a little while that fire on that piece of wood would go out and it no longer has any use christian friends we may think we do not need to come to church to fellowship but i want you to know that the longer we stay away from being together it is likely that our fire will go out that is a truism that um, will stand the test of time. And uh, I want you to know that God has made preparation for us when we come together to be protected because the great protector is in our midst. Um, the education department um, is organizing a project called Uni Connect. UniConnect, and that is, that is designed to, um, to keep in touch and support, encourage um, all our university students. This is very, very important. It's crucial that this happens because you, um, you will recognize that many of our youngsters who go off to university, oftentimes they do not return. I don't know what goes on there, but I want you to know that we need to keep in contact with all our, our youngsters who are at university. And we need, we need to pray for them constantly so that the power of the Holy Spirit will be um, their, their protector. Um, now, in, um, in, actually, in actually supporting these um, university students, um, we need to, um, it is said here, we need your prayers and support to assist our students in various ways. Um, you're asked to contact. If you believe that you can help and would like to help, um, your contact person, people are Cheryl Allen, Pauline Hutchinson, Jocelyn Fisher, Marlene Simpson Thomas, Glendine Shepherd, and Clarence Baker. Um, these individuals will be able to give you more information about the UniConnect and how you can help. So please um, feel free to, um, to contact. 
um, each one or any one of these individuals. And that is all that I wish to bring you at this time. Thank you so much, and may God bless you as we fellowship today.
as we prepare to enter the Holy Spirit into this place, please just reflect upon your hearts that this is the creator of all things that we are singing for as we open with our final neighbor. ago I stood here and I'm giving God a praise to know that I'm alive and I'm here giving praise to God this morning. So as we worship God this morning, we just want to give all our praise to him to know that he's our redeemer and he's soon coming king. I want to tell a brother and sister we're living in perilous time. And it's never a time when we need the Lord, it is now. So as we come to worship our Lord and Savior this morning, let us stand firm for God on a firm platform of the present truth that God is leading his people. It won't be long. We'll be going home. So let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, as we come before your throne this morning, we want to give you thanks. As we assemble for worship, Lord, nothing good we have done. But simple, Lord, we come at the foot of a cross to know that as you condescend upon us this morning, where life may reflect your character, O oh God. Baptize us anew, O oh Lord, and sanctify us a people as we worship you today. You may be blessed and be glorified in your name. Amen. Amen. Good morning, church. Morning. Happy Sabbath. Sabbath. How's everybody doing today? I'm going to pretend that was better than it was, okay, you know? Well, I'm just grateful to be back in the house of the Lord again, once again. You know, God has blessed me, um, woke me up another week, put me in my right mind to come to church and be able to praise his name today. 
as we've um, approached the end of our 10 days of prayer, the Bible says to pray without season, and it also says to make a joyful noise. So what we're going to do with this praise and worship session is just reflect on some songs that talk about spending time with Jesus, you know, in solitude with prayer, and just some songs to just glorify and adorn his name. So we're going to start with Bless the, um, Bless the Lord with Me, just a nice little one to just warm you up and to just get everybody, you know, ready for worship. So please sing as we join as we sing, Bless the Lord with Me. Some perks, um, if you just had a knee and you didn't have a leg, it wouldn't work. Just like God is the head and we just follow belief. We are all the body of Christ. And please join us in saying, I need to survive.
song says, <clears throat> here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God, you're altogether lovely, altogether worthy, altogether wonderful to me, and if he's been wonderful to you, please sing, here I am to worship.
Oh, for love's sake. song, Hymn 487, just simply says, and he walks with me, and he talks with me, and about you, but that's so simple, but yet so profound, like, the idea that God can just walk with us and talk with us, the fact that we even have that privilege as a creator of the universe, to just be able to just control and sit down and just tell him what's on our mind, how we feel, our worries, our fears, so please stand as we sing our opening hymn, and come to the garden alone.
joy that means he descends. And the joy we share as we serve Word of God says in uh, Second Chronicles chapter 29, verse 31, the Bible says, And Hezekiah answered and said, Now ye have uh, consecrated yourselves unto the Lord. Come near and bring sacrifices and thank offerings into the house of the Lord. And the congregation brought in sacrifices and thank offerings, and as many as were of a free heart, burnt offerings. This is the time where we um, would like to bring an offering to the Lord. In front of me is uh, the receptacle. I'm going to ask you if you will, after I have prayed, if you will just come on down and put your offering and your tithe in the, the container in front. Um, the blessings of the Lord will be upon it, I am sure. So let us pray. Our gracious God and our loving Father, you have blessed us bountifully. And so, gracious Lord, we want to bring an offering to you this morning. Um, we ask, Father, that you will bless the offering, bless the tithe, Lord, I pray that you will bless that which we have remained in our pockets. Give us the savvy to know exactly how to use that which remain. Our gracious Father, may your work in this part of the vineyard continue as a result of our sacrificial giving. This I pray in the mighty and the precious, wonderful name of Jesus Christ our Lord and our Savior. Amen. 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 Has God been good to you this week? <clears throat> just reminded to just think of the many blessings that God has provided for us and just remember to taste and see. So please, while you're given plentifully, sing O oh, Taste and See. So see that the Lord is good and his mercy endureth forever. Oh, 
So this is something that God says to one, says to us. Million love songs later, here I am trying to tell you that I care. Million love songs later, here I am. God cares for us, my people. God cares for us. Let us assume the posture of prayer. Uh, Holy Father, dear Jesus, sweet spirit, we come before you not because we are worthy. No, we are far from worthy, Lord, but we know that we are special, precious in your sight. You love us so much. You're crazy in love with us, Lord. There's nothing that we can do to make you love us more. There's nothing noble, beautiful, humanitarian that we can do to make you love us more. There's nothing evil, disgusting that we can do to make you love us less, Lord. Let us. There's nothing we can do to make you love us more 
There's nothing evil that we can do to make you love us less, Lord. You love us. You've given us the Sabbath day, Lord, for us. You gave it. To, you, we are more than the Sabbath. You say the Sabbath was made for us and not us for the Sabbath. We are more than the Sabbath, Lord. So thank you so much for giving us the Sabbath. Thank you, Lord, that we are special in your sight. Lord, there's so much suffering, evil, and pain in this place, in this world. It's unavoidable. We have this pain. But although we have this pain in this hellhole of a world, there is still its fawn, fawns, its roses with fawns and not fawns with roses. So thank you, Lord. Thank you for not abandoning us, for being there for us. Um, no, no, one, no one gets out of life alive, Lord. Um, we are, we, you know, no, there's no one escapes the pain. Uh, children are destroyed by their parents. The queen has to castigate her favorite son. You, Lord, your dear, sweet Jesus, had to go through so much pain and suffering and sacrifice so that we might have a life that measures with you, Lord. So thank you so much for giving yourself so that we might have life, Lord. Thank you so much. Um, but, Lord, there's, there's lots of pain, there's lots of evil, but you tell us, you tell us that we, our focus shouldn't be that. You say, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are, of any, if there be any good, any good virtue, any report, we should think on these things. So let us not focus on the negative, let us focus on the positive. And I would like to focus at this point, um, the main point of my prayer at this point is the focus on the men, Lord. I know that no man, ex man exists without a woman, so women are, you know, it, it, are, we are connected to the women as well, but I'm praying a special way for the men, Lord, that we might take our place in this world and we might stand up and be counted, Lord. The men are particularly important, although we might not think so, Lord, but we are very important in this plan, in this, in this earth, and if we would stand up and be counted, if we would let you control us, if you would let us um, influence us, Lord, if we might be the, the priests and kings that we should be, then, Lord, you could work for us. So I pray that we might allow you to do this, um, Lord. Um, there are good things that we are doing, and there are great things that we are doing, Lord. But if they are not God things, then they are almost worthless. So thank you, Lord, for all that you continue to do us. I ask for the men, please, let us be priests and kings. Let us, let, let us allow you to work in us so that we might change this world and turn this world upside down. This is my prayer for Christ's sake. Amen. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Those of you who have joined us online, I was just saying to, to uh, my sister Debbie there, there's something that you miss when you're at home, and that is the congregational singing. Praise team and band, thank you. You blessed my heart this morning. Praise be to God. Those of you at home, come out. Come out and join us. Come and fellowship with us. And most of all, come and meet Jesus here. Amen. Amen. Um, our scripture reading for today is taken from Exodus, the book of Exodus, chapter 16, verses 2 to 4. That's Exodus, chapter 16, verses 2 to 4. And it reads, Then the whole congregation of the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the children of Israel said to them, Oh, that we had died in, by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the pots of meat, and when we ate bread to the full. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill us, with the, to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain quota every day that I may test them whether they will walk, walk, by, walk in my law or not. So ends the reading of God's word. Please bless the reading of your word, Father. It's also my privilege to introduce the speaker. I don't know why it is that whenever I have to introduce pastor, his head goes down and he's wondering, what is she going to say about me now? <laughs> well, um, 
I was wondering, what do I say about this man? Because we know him so well. Um, but to those of you who don't know him or who may not know him, and those of you joining us online and from all over the world, I thought I'd give you a little glimpse into this man, Pastor Mario Philip. You know, they say confession is, is good for the soul. So I'm going to confess. I was one of those people who used to moan, why isn't our church open more often? We should be here seven days a week. We're not just Seventh-day Adventists, as in on a Saturday. We should be here all the time, seven days a week. Why aren't we reaching the community? And why isn't the community coming to us? Does the community even know that we're here? That was my moan. Yeah? Well, I complained, and I didn't do anything about it. But you know what? God did. God did. And he sent along a man, just a man, a humble man, but a man with a difference. And what was that difference? He was a man led by and filled with the Holy Spirit. And as a result, that man allowed God to use him. And guess what? The church isn't open just seven days a week. It's actually open for 24 hours of the day, seven days a week. What do I mean? Yes, our CHH are here and we have a presence here during the day, but the prayer line is open 24 hours a day as a result of the vision of this man, Pastor Mario Philip, allowing God to use him. You see, the church isn't just this building. It's not just these four walls. walls. The church is the people, and the people meet 24 hours a day, seven days a week. To God be the glory. So this man that I'm talking about is our very own Pastor Mario Philip, and he is our speaker for today. And if Pastor can allow God to use him in this church and in this community in the way that he has done, I know that God will use him this morning in this place. Amen? But before Pastor speaks to, to us, um, we will be blessed with a song of meditation from Marie, Mary, Paulette, and Tina, reminding us that when we pray, Everything will be all right.
Happy Sabbath, everyone. I could listen to that song every day. Um, I fall asleep with that song from Tina, Mary, and Colette. Yes, when we pray, everything will be all right. Amen. I'm very happy to be here with you this morning. Before I go into the message, I would like to express to Juliet Lewaz and her husband Richard my deepest sympathy on the loss of the mother of Richard. Richard lost his mother this week. And um, if you're listening to me, Richard and Juliet have touched base with you, but I want to, on behalf of the church here at Wilsden, let you know that we are praying for you. And we trust that God will strengthen you in this difficult time. So be comforted and know that we are here for you as a church family. And uh, we'll be praying that God will walk with you through this difficult period. I also um, want to remind you, this Wednesday will be our all-day prayer. Once a month, we meet online and we pray for the entire day, prayer and fast. So join me this Wednesday, the 19th, uh, together with the prayer team online as we pray together. Um, this year, we have to do a lot more praying than we've ever done. I tell you, brethren, it's not easy, but God is good. So uh, I want to begin a little ritual this morning. Um, we were, my wife and I was having some tr trouble getting our children to memorize the Bible. Because when I was in cradle roll, we used to call it then. Now they're changing them to beginners and kindergarten and everything. We used to memorize the scripture. I remember 13 Sabbath standing up in front of the church and having to repeat the 13 verses. And so I said to her, let's try to do the same with our kids. And no matter, these children are remembering songs on the TV. They are, you know, everything they see, they're remembering. And they can't remember the Bible. So um, we tried for, uh, you know, a year or two. And we find it. So I said to my wife, let's, let's join them. Um, why, why do we tell them to repeat the scripture if we are not doing it? So this year we started, um, we got a little chart in our house. Everyone has their chart and their names written. And every week we give each other stars. So already I have three stars for the month of January. And they don't want me to beat them. Children are very competitive. They don't want me to beat them. So, um, so we've been learning the, our, our memory verse. Um, I repeat it, they repeat it, Crystal repeat it, and we repeat it from head. So this morning, I want to repeat my memory verse for them. Because, <laughs> I mean, I said to them, last night was not a fluke, you know. And before I preach, I said to them, whenever I start to preach, Daddy will repeat his memory verse and commit it to his memory. And I tell the brethren, you know, it has been doing wonders for our kids. You know, whole day they're memorizing the scripture because they don't want daddy to repeat his and get his star and they don't get theirs, you know. So this week I, I memorized uh, all memory verses in Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 1, verses 2 to 3, but I challenged myself and I went to verse 4. And um, so let me, let me repeat it for you, okay? Right. In these days, in these last days, did I say in these last days? In these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made the universe. The son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word, after he had made a purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in the heaven. So he became as much superior to the angels, even as the name 
he inherited is superior to theirs. Amen? All right. I should get two stars for that. Because <laughs> it's one thing to repeat the memory text in a lot. You know, people, you know, it's not easy. <laughs> but folks, I want to challenge you. Do a memory, you know, do a little memory. You know, brethren, the word of God, as we memorize it, it does something for us. Uh, so I want to challenge you. Start with your, with your lesson, your memory text. And just learn it for the week. Just memorize it for the week. And as you hide the word in your heart, you will find that you will, it will do something for you in your, in your, in your overall life. So next week, um, uh, do your memory verse. And we're going to maybe get a, a large board with names and give you stars, you know, to encourage you to memorize the memory text. So this was my memory gem for this, for this week. Well, this morning, um, brethren, after this message, um, well, the 29th, we are speaking on Deliver Me From Fear. Um, but this morning is the message of all message. I've never prepared a message this difficult. And um, I could only do this after you have complete confidence and peace with God. So my message today is entitled, Deliver Me From People. And um, if you're still my friend at the end of this message, you'll be my friend for life. Deliver me from people. Let us pray. Father in heaven, Lord, what a joy it is to be able to speak your word. I pray, O oh God, today that you will stand with me, stand behind me, and strengthen me as I declare your word today in Jesus' name. Deliver me from people. I want you to call a friend and tell them, uh, come and let's pray that God will deliver this pastor today. They can be found everywhere you go. Some of them can be nice and really nice too. Others can be cruel and very cruel too. They can make you happy and leave you with precious memories. They can be agreeable, disagreeable, deeply opinionated, and even self-righteous too. They can cause you so much misery and pain, too deep for words to express. They come in all color, shapes, races, and language. They can support you today and turn against you tomorrow. They can praise you today and criticize you tomorrow. They can build you up today and tear you down tomorrow. They can love you and hate you together. They can be religious and irreligious in the same hour. They can smile at you, though being angry at you. They can cause you to believe they are for you when they're not. Who haven't sought the validation only to recognize it's impossible? Who haven't been infected with the venom of their words? Too often we are imprisoned by their attitudes. If you can survive people, the devil will flee from you. We have asked God to deliver us from sickness except people. We've asked him to deliver us from sin and Satan and forget to ask him to deliver us from people. People hurt people. Unless we are delivered from people, a lot of us will not make it to heaven. And so this morning, I've asked myself, why is it so many people are so spiritually dwarfed and not growing. Although attending churches, being taught good teachings, and seeing the beauty of Jesus' life, why aren't more people spirit-filled like the early church was? And I've recognized that a lot of us we are controlled by others. You need a good song to make you feel good and you stand up and you do your little thing. 
a jig, a gig, or whatever you call it. You need a good message to stir you. Why? We have become codependent so that our growth is dependent on someone else. Let me say this morning, I love my church, the Seventh-day Adventist Church. It's been a blessing in my life. Coming from Victoria in St. Mark's, Grenada, has taught me, my church has taught me everything I knew about the Bible and given me the confidence to dream. Um, the church is a wonderful place. But folks, if you're not careful, you can lose your salvation in church. The church is called to reach and witness to people and many are attracted to the church because of people. But many leave because of people. Many people leave church. I know people talk about the standards and teaching, but if more of us are different, a lot of people will be attracted to our winsomeness. The hindrance to love and unity in the church, yes, while the devil is behind it, he uses people. Many people are so affected by people that we become sad by their words, happy by their compliments. If they do not say amen when we sing, we think the song is not right. If they screw up the face or make a oh you know face when they when oh we feel so dejected. People control us. But you know, when I get to heaven, the first person I want to see after Jesus and then Crystal <laughs> and the children. But I want to see my wife in heaven. <laughs> After that, I want to see Moses. Because I want to ask Moses, Brother Moses, how do you deal with all them people them? And not go mental. I want to ask him that. Because I have a little church here. I say little because, you know, no matter, you know, Wilson is a big church. Um, Moses had thousands. Can you imagine? Now, Moses was born to Amram and Jochebed. And at three months, you know the story. His mother had to make a basket to save his life. He went to Pharaoh's army, to Pharaoh's palace at 12 years old. And he spent... Uh, the next 28 years learning. At 40 years, he got himself in trouble. And God had to take Moses away and prepare him for 40 years in the wilderness. So Moses was now 80. And still he wasn't ready to lead people. Now let me tell you this. Um, Moses, even though he was 40 God had to take him away to prepare him. Because I found that I studied the scripture. To lead people, you need preparation. You need moral education, formal education, experience, mental fortitude. To lead people, you need backbone. To lead people, you need perseverance. Because we not easy. Well, let me tell you, to lead religious people who are on their way to heaven, heaven bound. Are you hearing me this morning? I'm not talking about people in the world. To lead people who are bound for the promised land, you need help. You need wisdom. You need the Holy Spirit. Because church people can wear you down. Burn you out. And if you're not careful, they're going to heaven and you're not. Now, after this message, if I preach here again, it's because you're happy with me. 
Hold on, I haven't started yet. So to lead people, you must be fully prepared. And that's why, folks, ministry doesn't begin with an appointment from the conference. A lot of people think when the pastor comes here, the conference, God has to prepare a pastor in the womb. Jeremiah, he said, I formed you in the womb. God has to form you, make your heart to stand to represent him. I've got a PhD. I don't tell, I don't boast about a PhD. But that does not qualify me to stand before you. Because education cannot make you deal with people. In fact, some people don't care about your degree. Some people don't even care about it. Listen, folks, what prepares you to deal with people is God. God has to prepare you. In fact, when Moses was prepared by God, he said, I'm not eloquent. Hebrew, uh, Exodus chapter 4. He said, Lord, I can't speak. Who? And, you know, God the Lord said, no, Moses, I made your mouth. You go. But Moses recognized that to deal with people, even though you are 80 years old, the problems you're going to get, only God can help you. God must prepare you. So, leading people is more than an appointment. It is anyone can be appointed. But to lead God's way, you must be anointed. A lot of people see you may be doing a job and they think they can do it better. But listen, this job or any job in the church is more than an appointment. God must be preparing you, in Moses' case, for years. So don't be jealous of somebody when they're appointed. Some people say, oh, it should have been me. It should have been that other person. Hey, you don't know. God prepares us long before. So Moses was prepared. But folks, you see, God must call you to service. I know there are some people who call themselves. And then they are able to put a good front as if they are used by the Holy Spirit. But let me tell you this. I have found if God hasn't called you to lead or serve, you are going to get burnt out. If God didn't call you, your energy will be sapped away. Your spiritual growth will be stifled. If God didn't call you, you'll become bitter. People will make you angry. Angry in your soul. If Listen, folks, God has to call you. Because if, you, if he doesn't, you will break apart. So God said to Moses, I'm going to call you and send you back to Egypt. And I'm going to demonstrate my power through you. So you know the story. Ten plagues were sent to Pharaoh to soften his heart. Pharaoh led the people go. Uh, Moses led Israel from Egypt. It was their exodus. But God needed to deliver him and give him his exodus. You see, upon delivering the Israelites... God said to Moses in Exodus chapter 13, verse 17, he said to them, when Pharaoh let the people go, I'm reading from verse 17, God did not lead them by the way of the Philistines, although that was near. For God said, lest the people change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. Lest the people change their minds. You see, folks, uh, once you are leading or serving people, uh, people can change their minds easily. Uh, at some point in time, it is imperative that we lead people God's way. You see, God said to Moses, I'm not going to let you decide the way you're going to lead them. Follow my way. In fact, the way 
of the Philistines was nearer. They could have gone that way. Uh, they would have reached their destination quicker. But God said, no, I'm going to lead them the longer way because I know they will change their mind. Now follow me. When it is not if, people change their minds. And if they change their mind, they will blame somebody. Let it be that when people change their mind, they blame God, not you. You see, if you're not following God's way, they will blame you. They'll say, you caused me to do this. You told me to do this. And that's why you've got to always make sure you Bible people. Give them the Bible. Base your premises on the Bible. So that when they change their mind, it is God's word. See, God said to Moses, they're going to change their mind. I know they will want to go back to Egypt. But when they change their mind, remind them this is God's way, not Moses' way. See, when people change their minds, if they are following your ideas, your opinions, they will say, well, you told me to do that. I didn't want to do that. But when it's God's way, when they change their mind, keep them focused on God. Moses said, God said to Moses, they will change their mind. But go the different route. No, thank God that God told Moses, go this way. Because as sure as God said, they change their mind. Only a few days after leaving Egypt, Israel forgot all the miracles in Egypt. They even forgot they were slaves. In Exodus chapter 14, the Bible says, when the people, I'm reading from verse 12, drew near, when Pharaoh drew near, the people lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them, and they fared greatly. And the people cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, is it because there are no graves in Egypt? That you have taken us out here to die? What have you done to us in bringing us out of Egypt? Is not this what we said to you in Egypt? Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. For it is better for us to serve the Egyptians. That's what the people are saying. Now, can you believe these people? They were slaves for 430 years. Now they are saying to Moses, why did you free us? We preferred being dictated to by Pharaoh. We love being his slaves and him our slave master. We rather being beaten to work. We rather being robbed of our rightful pay. We rather our children work as child slaves. Why did you bring us out here? We prefer being overworked, underpaid. Moses, slavery is better. Now, what is, what is interesting is this. And you see, folks, I tell you, people change their minds so easily. In Exodus chapter 2, the people said to the Lord, Exodus chapter 2 verse 23, they forgot they said that. The Bible said in Exodus chapter 2 verse 23, and Israel groaned because of their slavery and cried out for help. Their cry for rescue came up to the Lord. They forget they cried. They forget they cried to God for help. Now they are saying, why did you help us? Deliver us today, O oh God. You see, folks, sometimes... Israel forgot 430 years of hardship. 430 years of God's providential living, leading. In an instant when they saw Pharaoh's army, they wanted to go back. Now, I have found that sometimes the thing people remember the most and longest about you is the one thing you did not do. Or the one thing you said wrong. 
The one time you failed them. The one time you disappointed them. The one occasion you stumbled. You may be working hard. Listen, brethren. You may be doing a lot for years. Such goes unnoticed. You may work on tiring relentlessly. For, no one comments on it. But the one time you do one thing wrong, that becomes the rumor. Nobody talks about the sacrifices. Nobody talks about the commitment you give. Nobody talks about the, the times when you do it alone. But the one time, uh, you know, I found folks that no matter how hard you work, there will always be some who think you are not doing enough. No matter how much calls you make, some will think you're not calling enough. No matter how much sermons you preach, some will think you haven't preached enough. No matter how much you visit, someone will think you're not visiting enough. No matter how much you give of yourself, your efforts will never be enough. And so, if you base your effectiveness by the assessment of others, you're in trouble. If your motivation for service is hinged on the validation of others, you will be crushed, demoralized, demotivated, and want to throw in the towel. I mean, God has been so good to Israel for years. One time they see Pharaoh army chasing them, and they want to go back to Egypt. Now, your affirmation and motivation for service must come from God. No matter how much people tell you you're doing a good job, take it with a pinch of salt. Because some of them don't, some of them are not honest about it. Make sure that what drives you is God. So that even if there is no one around, you will still do it. Now, the same people who wanted to return to Egypt, now in less than 24 hours, they changed their mind again. The Bible said in Exodus chapter 14 verse 31, when the people saw the power of God displayed against the Egyptians, that is God caused all the Egyptians to die in the Red Sea, they believed in the Lord again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh God, you're so great. They just wanted to go back to Egypt, you know. And not only that, the Bible said they started singing and praising the Lord. <laughs> and listen to their songs. Listen to their songs. Exodus chapter 15. I will sing to the Lord. <laughs> they just wanted to go back, you know. For he has triumphed greatly. The horse and his rider. Listen. Don't take every word you hear as genuine, you know. Because you, you know, you know, you think, you know, we're gonna come to it in a while. But, but they just wanted to go back. Now they see what God has done. They are praising Him. The Lord is my strength. That's what they're saying. And my song, He has become my salvation. And this is my God. I will praise Him. My God, my Father, I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. Brothers and sisters, take words with a pinch of salt. You know, I've found that uh, sometimes we hear nice speeches, nice elocutions, nice singing. And we say, oh, that's spiritual. Oh, he sung spiritual. Well, there's some spiritual here. But let us see. Let us see if that song meant anything. It wasn't a day after they sang. The Lord is my strength. They became hungry. And they forgot all the songs. They forgot the sermon in church. They forgot the deliverance in the Red Sea. 
It was one day they were thirsty and they came to Mara. And the waters were bitter. What did they do? Did they say, Moses, let us pray? Moses, let's go to the upper room. Did the people say, Moses, God has been so good. Let's trust him to provide water. What did they do, people? Exodus chapter 15, verse 23. The Bible said, when they came to Marah, they could not drink the water because it was bitter. And the people grumbled against Moses, saying, what shall we drink? How can, how, how can you be singing praises in one breath and in the same breath showing faithlessness? You know, folks, I don't know, but how did Moses survive? Uh, with the, you know, you know, you know in, in fact, um, you know, these people had an opportunity to actually show that, that, that God, that God who parted the Red Sea can, what, what is it in it in a little bit of water? If God can part the sea, God can certainly cause water to come down from heaven. But folks, no, these people, they were somewhat like camouflage. They can appear holy, sanctimonious, religious, but they are with God for the wrong reasons. Now, things will get even more interested. You would have, so, 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 you know, God gave them water. Thank God he doesn't treat us like we treat him. God turned the water sweet or drinkable. And you would have thought that after complaining, um, that they would have actually said, you know what, folks? Um, you know, we see what the Lord has done for us. Um, he just delivered us from Egypt. He parted the Red Sea. He just turned the waters of Mara uh, sweet and make us drink. Uh, you would have thought that they would have trusted him even more. The Bible tells us in Exodus chapter 16, verse 2 to 4, the whole congregation again came and they grumbled. <laughs> They grumbled. In fact, they said, Would that we have died by the hand of the Lord in Egypt when we ate the meat pots and ate bread to the fool. Now, folks, I don't know. Here we have the people complaining about their diet. We miss the meat in Egypt. We ate bread on you. Bring us out in this wilderness. We know that the Lord has parted the Red Sea. We know we sang about his strength, but we ain't care about that today. In fact, there are some of us when, you know, our thinking is so peripheral. We sometimes, oh, don't tell me about that today. That was on Sabbath. Today is not Sabbath. Listen to me. I don't care what day is it. Whatever day we meet you, you are Christian. Don't tell me, oh, pastor, I'm in church. I'm not. Listen, you are a Christian anywhere, everywhere. And now, these people, you know, they, 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 they just had that experience with the Lord. And now they are, they are saying, Moses... Or diet in Egypt was better. So they were accusing God and Moses of bringing them out of Egypt to kill them. They complained that Egyptian food was better than God's food. Israel wanted to follow the, their cravings. They trusted in Egypt to keep them healthy. Than God's grace to sustain them. Interestingly, Israel couldn't focus on God's past mercies because they were fixated on their present needs. See, folks, sometimes we are so preoccupied with our present problems, the health problems, the family challenges, the, the finances, the job, that we have no time to look at the power and greatness of God. I have found that the more time you spend focusing on your problems, the smaller God appears. Rather, the more time you spent focusing on God, the smaller your problems appear. 
In other words, what you spend more time focusing on defines your reality. Sometimes we complain too much in our prayers about this and that. Oh, Lord, about this. <laughs> Leave your burdens to the Lord. He'll take care of you. He'll take care of you. God will take care of you. The songwriter says, be not dismayed. Whatever be tied, God will take care of you. You don't have to moan and groan about it. If you've got a problem, tell it to Jesus. Some people in the middle, oh, pastor, the same old story. Same old story. Come on, wake up. God can take care. Stop making God look as if he's an ungrateful God. He's not. He's faithful. God is faithful. He provides every time. He may not always give you what you want, but he's faithful. I've got to hear some because I did not give me time to preach my message this morning. God will take care of your needs. In fact, you know, sometimes I love the promises in Psalm 34 and verse 10. It says, the lions suffer and want, but those that seek the Lord will, want, will not want any good thing. Psalm 37 verse 25 says, I've been young and now I'm old and I've never seen the righteous Forsaken, Psalm 84 and verse 11. For the Lord is a sun and a shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing will he withhold from they that walketh uprightly. Brothers and sisters, God can take care of you. But I recognize people will be people. No matter how much you give them. No matter how much you do for them, no matter how much you sacrifice, people will be people. So the Lord gave them manna. And you know, God is so good, you know. You know, if God was one of those dictators we have in the world, he'll get vexed. But God is so good, he gave them manna. The Lord said, I'm about to rain down manna on you, bread from heaven. And you would have thought that after receiving manna, the people would have said, now it is well. You would have thought that all complaining would have stopped. Well, the Bible tells us it did not. In Exodus chapter 17, verse 2, the Bible said the people quarreled with Moses. Again, give us water to drink. Moses said, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people tested for water and they grumbled and said, why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with curse? Now, earlier it was bread. Now it is water. You see, these people think that God is only a man of God who can give them bread. They forgot the miracle at Marah when God gave them drinking water. And so here the people chose to forget the goodness of God. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, what is interesting is that the people are quarreling with Moses. Thank God that this only happened back then. People don't quarrel with leaders today. Not at Wilsden. Well, I thought only in the Bible people disrespect pastors. And listen to me, brothers and sisters. You know, when you look in the scripture, I was comforted when I saw that people talked to Moses, that great leader, anyhow. And there are some of us who have no respect for leaders. 
We think we can talk any and anyhow. Now, the pastor may look younger than you, but he's the man of God. And the way you speak to a pastor matters. Not just a pastor, any person representing God. Now, let me say this this morning, brothers and sisters. I found that Israel decided to turn on Moses because they could not have their women fancy. So Moses became the problem. Hold on, I'm coming. But not, not only that, not only that, in Numbers chapter 11, again, the Bible said the people started to weep. Oh, we had the meat to eat. So they got water. They got manna. Now they want chicken. <laughs> Listen, you think we easy? <laughs> I don't know what can God do to please us. They say, oh, we had the chicken in Egypt. Oh, we ate the fish. It cost us nothing. We had the cucumbers and the melons. We had the garlics. Now, look at us. You have us up here only eating vegetables, drinking water. Moses, why did you do that? I can't believe these people. Can God satisfy people? You know, listen to me. If God couldn't make these people happy, I don't know who could make people happy. You know, uh, do you think we are much different today? Sometimes I ask, what more does people want God to do to prove that he loved them? He not only gave them physical food, he came and he died for them. He gave his life for them, and yet still, that doesn't make them happy. Now, this year is my 18th year in ministry. 18 years ago, I entered the ministry. And when I started ministry, I was very afraid of people. So I wanted everyone to love this pastor. I wanted to be the good pastor in everybody's eyes. I was visiting like crazy. You know, I, 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 I wanted to be loved by the young people. I was, you know, I, I, I tried my best. When we got married, I had my wife trying to be the perfect pastor's wife. You know, in fact, I even bought some hats for my wife. <coughs> Because, because, you know, you have these ideals, you know, you know, you know, of what the pastor's wife should look like. I was scared of criticism. I was scared to take tough decisions. I was scared to preach difficult messages. I was scared of people writing the conference. Some people like to hold the pen up in the air with the paper and say, I'm going to write the conference. So I was scared. I don't want to make the church angry. I was scared of getting a phone call. I said, Pastor, what's going on down there? And so I was doing ministry to make people happy. I was scared to enforce church principles. Scared to uphold standards. I was scared of not having a career. And so for the most part of my ministry, I was seeking validation from the church. And then God showed me that before I had a career, I had a calling. Your calling supersedes your career. If you have a calling, you will always find a job. 
but you must seek validation from God. And so right now in ministry, I am no longer afraid. I am now obligated to God. The spirit of prophecy. I stand on the word of God. Hey, I may lose some friends, but I am more concerned about eternity. This pastor here is going to love everybody. But when it comes to the word of God, I'm going to stand alone. My mind is made up on that. You see, folks, sometimes we are too afraid. You know, some people, some people say, you know, folks, they say if you, you know, you know, they say, oh, you know, re remember, we are the ones who can vote for you. So, so be careful how you treat us. Well, it doesn't matter anymore. You can do whatever you want. A man of God must stand on the word. You see, folks, serving people is not easy. If you ask for help, some will think you're getting lazy. If you don't ask for help, they'll call you a dictator. If you give a little, you could have done better. If you give too much, you're showing off. Uh, if you ask some to serve, they'll decline. You give someone else the work to do, and they will say that only one set of people doing the work. You cast a vision and set an agenda, it will be a one-man one -man vision. You do not cast a vision, you're accused of having no plans. You spend much time in the community, you neglect in the church. You spend more time in the church, you neglect in the community. You fix the roof, someone will ask you about the floor. You fix the floor, someone will ask you about the windows. You paint the church in gray, someone would say it should be painted in white. You paint it in white, someone will say, why did you ever paint the church at all? You focus on evangelism, some will ask you about conservation. You focus on conservation, others will say, why not do evangelism? You uphold standards, you are deviating from the faith. You uphold standards, you are cultural. You don't uphold standards, this is a pastor of no standard. You see folks, you can't please people. So I am finished with pleasing people. I'm going to stand on the word of God. I told you after today, my friends will get less. Interestingly, when people cannot have their way and have you doing what they want, how they want it, when they want, they turn on you. And that is what Israel did to Moses. They turned on Moses, one of the meekest men ever. And they openly criticize him. Try to stone him to death. And even remove him from office. Let's read it in the Bible. I'm reading from Numbers chapter 12, 14, verse 2. All the Israel grumbled again against Moses. And they said, Woe to God that we have died in Egypt. That's like their mantra now. Is their hymn. Woe to God we have died in Egypt. Why is the Lord bringing us up into this land to fall by the sword? Our wives and ours, would it be better for us to die? And they said to another, let us choose another leader. That will take us back to Egypt. So Israel wanted a new leader. Now interestingly, um, number 16 also said, they came to Moses again, that is the sons of Korah. And they said to him, you have gone too far. All the congregation is holy. Every one of Why do you exalt yourself among the congregation? Do you think you are so special, Moses? And in Exodus chapter 17, they were ready to stone him. What will get into the hearts of Israel to want to remove Moses from office? And to go as far as wanting him dead. The answer is simple. 
when people cannot get their way, it's amazing what they will do. Yes. Moses is one of the most humblest men that ever walked the earth. And still, people criticized him, wanted him removed, and even stoned. Well, folks, let me say this morning. Uh, <clears throat> we will... Uh, we are living in a culture today where if you're not careful, leaders will be led by others. Uh, because there is always, you know, I wonder who they would have appointed in the place of Moses. They said, let us appoint a leader that will take us back to Egypt. But I've found today that there are always people who think that they can do it better than you. They can run the church better. Now, interestingly, my wife, <coughs> she studied molecular biology. So when I need to check something in science, I ask her. And when she tells me the answer, I don't always agree with it, but I trust her word because that's her area. I have a good friend, <coughs> a dear friend of mine, Wesley George, who is a computer specialist. When my computer is giving problems, he connects to me through Team Viewer, diagnoses my problem and fixes it. I don't argue with Wesley. He studied computer. I find it strange that in the field of theology, everyone thinks they know theology better than the pastor. Now, when people go to the doctor, they don't argue with a doctor who studied medicine. You go to a psychologist, you don't argue with the psychologist. But everyone knows the Bible better than the pastor who studied theology. So I found in the church today that when you speak with people and tell them what the Bible says, having studied the language, they will tell you what they think the Bible says. Now, so for fear of upsetting others, some leaders just allow them to do their thing. And say, you know what? I don't want to upset the church. I don't want to make anyone vex. This will cause me to lose popularity. And so we are living in an age where too many of us are scared. Scared of threats. Scared of actions. The influence of others. Because people have power in their hands. Some are influential, they can use their power. And so a lot of us do ministry out of fear. Now, what is even more interesting here is that the children of Israel said to Moses, who you think you are? You think you're more holier than anybody else here? The Holy Spirit speak to all of us here. And so they, were, they now begin making light of the calling of Moses and casting aspersion. Folks, I hope things have changed today. I hope things have changed today. Moses, the meekest man on earth, could not control these people. Even Jesus came to this world. He was ridiculed and spat upon and even crucified. But <clears throat> what Korah and his rebellious faction didn't recognize is that Moses had a calling and anointing on his life. When a man or woman is anointed, be careful. Because God will work. <laughs> you know, serving God goes further and is deeper than an appointment. God, uh, God alone can remove your calling. So removing Moses from the leadership is not removing his calling. Now, your career may be removed. But if you have your calling, God will make room for you somewhere else. Well, let me bring this message home quickly. Finally, after 40 years of constant murmuring and stress and frustration, Moses snapped. And let me tell you, brothers and sisters, leaders are humans. Moses snapped under the pressure. 
The people provoked him to anger. He disobeyed God, struck the rock instead of speaking to the rock. And he claimed he was able to bring water out of the rock. Consequently, he lost the opportunity of leading Israel into Canaan. The Bible said, Moses said in Numbers chapter 20, verse 10, Hear now, you rebels, shall we bring water out of the rock? And he lifted up his hand and struck the rock twice, and water came out. And the Lord said to him, You have not believed me to uphold me as holy. Therefore, you will not bring this assembly into the land that I've given to them. Leaders can err. Leaders are human beings. And let me tell you this. The enemy celebrates when we fall. And because he knows that when a leader falls, he loses credibility and spiritual authority. Moses' experience reminds us that the best of us have our weaknesses and our vulnerability. Brothers and sisters, it doesn't matter if you like a leader or not. Pray, pray, pray for him. Because... The leader's strength is not contingent on him. He needs the prayer and support of those who he's leading. Now, those who you lead can cause you to lose your patience, your conviction and your focus, and even your salvation, and cause you to become rebellious against God. If you're not careful, they will make it to Canaan. Now, I've made a resolution. It would not be a nice thing to see people who I have pastored, prayed for, counseled, encouraged, enter Canaan and pastor it out. It's possible. It's possible. We cannot assume as leaders that because we are leaders, we have an automatic pass to heaven. There is no pastoral badge that you show to the angel and you enter heaven. Leaders must be faithful to God. But more than that, when you are a leader, you are accountable to God in the judgment. You may get a passing grade from your church and your conference and a failing grade from God. That's why it's important that as a leader, that you are honest and in, and that you are true to God. Be true to God. Because one day, I have to give an account to God. So Moses was put to rest at 120 years old. 120 years. After years of grueling, Leadership, stress, insults, near death stoning, murmurings and complaints. There is no record, and this is the point in the message now, of anyone ever going to Moses during his leadership and say, Brother Moses, you're doing a good job. Have you read that in the Bible? Moses, we're praying for you. For four decades of his leadership, no flowers were given to Moses. But something very interesting happened when he died. And this is actually where this message should begin. When Moses died. I thought there would have been a celebration when he died. Because remember... They wanted him removed from office. Remember, they wanted him to be stoned. 
Remember the moment against him? Remember that? So I thought when he died, those who wanted him out of office would have celebrated and said, now we have an opportunity to put our man. I thought that all Moses' opponents would have seized the opportunity and execute their plan. But no. What did they do? Deuteronomy 34, 10 tells us. And the people wept for Moses. 30 days. Oh, these people are confusing. For years you give the man stress. Years you threaten him to kill him. Now he's dead. Your obstacle is removed. Why are you weeping for? The same people who are disobedient, giving you stress, plotting to remove you. After they kill you, they're still crying for you. It is, you know, it's interesting, it's interesting that when you're in a particular district, there'll be some people, now everybody will never like you, but there'll be some people who, um, they can't wait for you to leave. When are you leaving? When is the conference changing this pastor? They want a new pastor to come. They, they don't like your style of leadership. And after you're gone, they have the best things to say about you. It's amazing at our funerals, even our enemies become our friends. I want to say we need to stop this as people. Give people their flowers when they're alive. Stop being hypocrites. If you know you are not happy, don't say you are happy. But while someone is here, tell them how much you appreciate them. Tell them how much you are praying for them. Tell them now how much you are standing with them. Don't wait until they're going for no farewell speeches. We like too much farewell speeches. Moses was now dead and gone. And 30 days they're weeping for what? Dry your tears and let Joshua do his job. But folks, God has to deliver us from people. The affirmations of people, the validation of people, the commendation of people, the criticism of people. Let them come, but my dear friend, stand strong. Stand like the brave. You are only where you are for a God-appointed time. And one day when I stand before the Lord and he asks me, Mario, now is your accountability. I want to say to him, I did my best while I was at Wilsden. I don't know what will happen when I am gone. But while I'm here, I'm going to do my best for the Lord. I want to end this message today with a quotation from Ellen White. Ministry of Healing, page 484. She says, the work of many... The work of many a burden bearer is not understood. His labors are not always appreciated until death lays him low. When others take up the burden he has laid down and meet the difficulties he encountered, they can understand how his faith and courage was tested. Often then the mistakes they were so quick to censure are lost sight of. Experiences teaches them sympathy. God permits men to be placed in positions of responsibility. When they err, he has power to correct or to remove them. We should be careful not to take into our hands the work of judging that which belongs to God. The conduct of David towards Saul has lessened. By command of God, Saul has been anointed as king over Israel. Because of his disobedience, the Lord declared the kingdom should be taken from him. And yet... How tender and 
courteous and forbearing was the conduct of David towards Saul. Brothers and sisters, if we can win the battle against each other and not be affected by each other, we can gain heaven at last. Serve Jesus. Even if you have to stand alone. Do your best. Even if no one agrees with you. Even if you have to be a Daniel. I dare you this morning. Do not be afraid of the crowd. Stand for the truth. Though the heavens fall. Today, this preacher is convinced in his heart that he's going to stand alone. I want to challenge you this morning. Stand alone. Stand like the brave. Because if God calls you, he'll empower you. If there is someone this morning, this is not for everybody, but someone here this morning want to say, Pastor, by the grace of God, I'm going to stand like the brave with Jesus as my captain. If that's your desire, you're looking online this morning. If that's your desire, just wave your hand where you are. Let me pray for you. Let me pray for you. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, for delivering me from what I perceive people should do and say. Thank you, Lord, for hinging my confidence in your word. Lord, though in life we have to go through many a trials, help but by the grace of God we will stand on your word. Thank you this morning for your church. Each person here, Lord, will have to go through their own crucible where their service to you may be impacted on or affected by others. Oh God, today I pray that you will give them the courage to serve you in spite of people, irrespective of others. Father, we can sometimes be harsh to each other, but help, oh God, this morning that we will all stand firm, that we'll stand on your word. We will del be delivered from the hurt and the pain that others have caused us in the past, but by your grace, we will be resolute that we will not waver we will not bow. We will remain true to your calling in our lives. And so this morning, Father, I place your church in your hand. I place our lives in your hand. I ask you to lead us as you've led Israel. And when at last you shall come to take us to that heavenly Canaan, may we be found faithful in Jesus' name.
He leads me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. You see, when you become a believer, the spirit is made right. But sometimes the soul doesn't get the notice. It has a hole in it due to things that has happened in the past, hurt, abuse, molestation. But we want to speak to you today and tell you that God wants to heal the hole in your soul. You see, some people's actions are not because their spirit is wrong. It's because their past has left a hole in their soul. May this wisdom help you get over your past and remind you that God wants to heal the hole in your soul. I 